Uh, as, as Elena said, I, I lived in Denver, Colorado before moving to, to New York. I actually live in Jersey City. And just briefly, uh, a month ago in Colorado, they lowered the minimum wage um, in, in response to the, the economic crisis that is going on here. Um, minimum wage is 720. It's at the, it's at the, the, um, the bottom floor, the, the min very minimum that you can make in this country. Um, it was about 10 cents higher, 10, 15 cents higher until they lowered it. Um, <clears throat> the reason why I say that is because when people think of Denver, they think of, uh, people think of it as, as a place with a higher standard of living. They think of the mountains <laughs> and clean air and skiing and Aspen and most of Colorado ain't like that. Aspen is on the western slope. It's a place unto itself. Denver is just like any other metropolitan city in the U.S. It has a lot, large, actually predominantly it is a city of people of color. Um, has a lot of poverty just like most urban, uh, urban areas do. Uh, it has a large uh, indigenous population per their actual population in the country. And Colorado was actually a place where they drove indigenous people off of their reservations and into the city area. So when you see the, the homeless population, it's, it's majority black in a city that's really only about 12% black, but high concentrations of homelessness of indigenous people there. Um, as I went over in you know, my talk in the, the, the panel uh, just before this, the situation that they're facing youth are, have grown uh, even more drastic than they were before. Now we've, there, there, there's been a long period of, it used to be when I uh, first began entering into the work uh, um, uh, work field, and when I, I grew up in Pennsylvania, and there you could get a work permit and work at the age of 15, which is what I did. Um, usually, youth went into went into fast food. Most youth work in either retail or hospitality, you know, uh, type ser or food service. Um, and it used to be that you go into McDonald's and you get a job, or Burger King, or Pizza Hut, or Taco Bell, one of the fast food places. And when you go, most people who, you know, I don't know how the age range of people, but you you know, 10 years ago you go into a McDonald's and usually the cashiers would be young people between the ages of 16 and maybe 22, something like that, and the people working in the back. That isn't so much anymore because because of the you know, people being driven out of the factories, because of the decline of construction recently with the economic crisis and a lot of the you know, uh, manufacturing in general, uh, warehouse and stuff like that. People who had worked those jobs have been driven into these low, these low-paying service jobs like your Walmart. I mean, I don't know if people remember, but Walmart used to have these commercials where they'd show these uh, uh, elderly people who would be the greeters. And this was some sort of progressive thing that elderly people just decided, oh, you know what, I want to go into Walmart and greet for like six dollars an hour. <laughs> <clears throat> that isn't, you know, that was because of the conditions that people were living under. But Walmart, you know, would would. Have, they would have commercials about it, and, you know, and they'd have the people talking about, oh, that's Sam, I love Sam, and <laughs> Sam would say, oh, I love the people who come into the store, and I love Walmart, <laughs> and the reality is Walmart don't love Sam, and Sam probably hates Walmart. <laughs> um, because Walmart, there's no health care, you're super exploited, they don't have very uh, many full-time workers, they leave you just underneath uh, working full-time, um, you have to have an open schedule. It's a very repressive and oppressive conditions. People are due force overtime, and then there was a large sexual harassment suit that was filed against Walmart. Um, but these are the conditions that the young people are dealing with. And one of the, the, the struggles that we've seen bubble up within the last year or so is the struggle around the right to higher education and the budget cuts. Um, because Public schools have been hit by the fact that there have been the uh, class sizes have, have increased because teachers have been faculty have been wage uh, laid off, and that's a struggle itself uh, because many of the faculty are adjunct and not don't have full professorship, um, especially here in New York. And tuition has gone up across the board, public and private. People have had to mortgage their futures even more by taking out incurring larger and larger amounts of debt. Um, and for and when when you get out, there aren't necessarily any jobs for you to go to. That is essentially what we're dealing with. We're dealing with young people, many have, who have not had jobs and who don't know exactly where they're going to go if they can go to college when they graduate or even when they get out of high school. 
and it's something that we have to begin to counter uh, and fight against. And we see that there's a number of demonstrations. In Berkeley, there was a demonstration. In San Diego, there were demonstrations against the budget cuts. Um, University of Maryland, uh, the budget cuts there, the way that they're manifesting themselves is that progressive black professors and um, <laughs> administrators have been laid off. The, one of the founders of the Nyan Baru Center, an LGBT center in the University of Maryland, was recently just fired, um, along with the declining numbers of people of color, specifically black uh, people being able to allowed into the college. They had over 700 people that mobilized and had a demonstration there, and, it, and the struggle continues because now they're talking about closing the Nyan Baru Cultural Center, which was won through struggle, um, and it's, it's being threatened to be closed. Um, and it's, I just actually talked to one of the leaders of that, who's a, a, a professor, and he also was the, the, was the vice director of the Nyan Brew Cultural Center. And he, we have, David Hoskins and I, we work in CUNY, we go to CUNY, to CCNY up, uptown in Harlem, on 137th Street, and we work with a number of coalitions. And one of the things that have come out of coalition work that we've done against the budget cuts as they affect people here and against the, the possible rise in tuition per sem every semester after this one is we've been able to push through an initiative for a national day of coordinated actions against budget cuts and for education. Now this has a lot of potential and number one, when you talk about education, it's not just higher education, it's high school as well and what's the privatization of, the high, of high schools but also the um, military recruiters on college campuses and in high schools. Um, in the situation of youth not having any jobs, uh, youth unemployment. Because, you know, one of the, finally, you know, the, the thing is, in this society, generally a lot of people, because this is what we've been taught all our lives, they measure themselves based off of what everyone else is doing and how everyone else is living. That's how we're taught. We're taught to be a competition for them. That's how capitalism, that's how capitalism works. You, you compete for jobs. You compete to survive, really. Um, so, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> um, so, it, it's, it's um, because of that fact, because people are competing against jobs, it, it, it's, it's, you have to, it's a struggle to wage a struggle of showing people why you have to be in solidarity with one another. Um, and I think that that can grow out of having a national initiative against, uh, against the budget cuts and the rise in tuition. And I think it's absolutely important. Um, but it also changes. That, that whole process of waging that kind of initiative, who knows how successful it's going to be, how many thousands may come out, or hundreds, or what the numbers might be, <laughs> but the fact that it can happen, it can raise people's consciousness, um, because no longer will people be struggling in isolation, New York here, Los Angeles and California here, and uh, Wisconsin here, and Maryland there, but everyone will be have a common, it, there are specific things that are happening on each campus, but there is a com idea of a common program around everyone has a right to education, and everyone has a right to their dignity, and everyone has a right to a job. Because without a job, without being able to pay, to pay, you know, to, to survive and to buy food and put clothes on your back, or your children's back, you know, you're stripped of, of that dignity, and you're stripped of that idea of self-worth, because self-worth is measured against what everybody else is doing. So struggle changes that. And, you know, this is just sort of give an idea of what we're, you know, when Elena read that, that program, it's really what we do. That is what we organize around. We're a fighting organization. We don't sit around tables and pontificate. That's important, too. But it's more important. You win people by being in the struggle and being in the streets, and that's what we're dedicated to. So hopefully if you're on a campus somewhere in another part of the country and you're interested, we should talk about that, how we're going to build that struggle and its relation of the struggle for education to the struggle for jobs, the struggle against prisons, the struggle against the military-industrial complex, and all these other issues. So.